And I'm going to pray while you're sitting down. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for uh, allowing us to gather together tonight, Lord, to um, Lord to lift one another up in prayer, to lift your name up in praise, Lord, that you are worthy of our praise, worthy of our time, Lord, um, worthy of our worship. We pray, Lord, that this blessing would be, this uh, service would be a blessing in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, announcements, announcements. Uh-oh. Stay on the screen. There we go. There you go. Now they're on the screen. <laughs> Builders for Christ is today the 25th. Hey. Builders for Christ will be here in a few days. We actually have the leaders here. We've got a few of them here ahead of time. So we are so, so thankful for everyone Amen. that is building our church next door. Thank you so much for giving of your time. Of, uh, of your money, of your energy, and of your knowledge to, uh, to put together this building, actually. Um, what else we got? Builders for Christ. We got uh, camp. Camp is the 25th, which is when the Builders for Christ are going to be here. Yeah. So this coming Monday, we are rolling out at 1.30. Be here by 1.15. No later than 1.15. Because there will be some element of chaos as everyone has to use two bathrooms at the same time among a couple dozen people. Um, have all your stuff packed up, everything sorted out, ready to as leaving from Mandatory, you need to be a parent or five o'clock. Have a they go over. Um, you meeting. All right. They are of an age where you're more than welcome to come. Green.
another in the name of the Lord. interesting hymn. Most of the time, someone writes the words almost like a poem, and then someone comes along behind them and, and puts uh, music to it. If I'm not mistaken, someone wrote the music to this song, and a certain lady named Fanny Crosby heard it and said, that says, Blessed Assurance, and she wrote the words to this song from the music. Uh, Brother David, would you ask the blessing on this offering? Sure, Father, just thank you this day. Just thank you for the blessing you give us what those people say. Brother Rod, as he brings the message, be with the uh, Builders of Christ uh, next week. Let's start working on the, the church. Yes, sir. Let's give them safety. And just uh, be with offering about to receive. You might use further on your glory. I'll say so. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Now's the time for, for prayer request or praise the Lord. Anyone? Miss Paula? Uh, my mom has COVID. We'll be praying for her. Miss Paula says her mom has COVID. As to Shannon Busby, uh, she's actually a lady who comes to church here, her and her husband, uh, Lucky. They're friends with real close family members and friends with uh, Miss Arlene. And uh, uh, she has something called MG. It's a, what is it? Myasthenia gravis. That's what she said. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it has been out of her system for the last couple of years. And it, when it comes on her, it's really serious and it's really hard to breathe. It's really hard to do a lot of things. And so just put Shannon Busby on your prayer list, okay. as well as Sophia Blunt. B-O-U-N-T. That's uh, Paula and I's niece. Uh, she's, uh, we're going to induce her at midnight tonight. We we're supposed to induce her today. High blood pressure uh, kind of stopped that for a little while. So they're going to start at midnight tonight. Okay. We got uh, Brother Roger requesting prayer for Miss Shannon Busby. Uh, attends church here, friends of Miss Arlene. She has something called MG. Um, don't ask me to try to pronounce what it stands for. But uh, just medical issues, uh, just need your prayers. And uh, Brother Rogers, 
niece, Miss Sophia Blount. Does that sound right? Yep. Uh, she is being induced tonight at midnight. So definitely prayers for uh, safe delivery. Yes, sir, Brother Caden. One unspoken for Brother Caden Carlson. Yes, ma'am. We had blessing three times a day, especially because one person motioned to us to move over. Something was wrong with our car. Then the next person, we go into Walmart's parking lot, comes out. We're trying to get our car and camper into a Walmart, and they come just directly out of their car and come over to help us. And then the next thing is that we went into Walmart to figure out what what we could do and call people and stuff where it was cool. And a guy at our car was changing our tire without, he was trying to get out of there before we, we even knew about it. What's your name, ma'am? Miss Dina. Miss Dina? Miss Dina? Yes. Dina, one of our builders, has three praise the Lords, um, had some car problems, and uh, someone uh, alerted her of that. Uh, two, they got some guidance in uh, getting off the road and uh, into Walmart, and uh, had an uh, anonymous, uh, we'll say a good Samaritan, uh, changing their tire, trying to get away with it before you knew it. So uh, they were trying to give you a blessing without... without trying to take recognition for themselves. So. That's what the gospel, that's what we're called to do right there, is yeah. to do our alms, not where others uh, can see us. But and to actually saw the sign, there was a Christ yeah, on the course. car, and he says, I couldn't stop and not help you out. <laughs> so. Scripture says uh, to love the brethren, that's I right. believe. So. He said Just. his brother was a volunteer Christian builder on the camp. What are the odds? <laughs> Almost like one of those coincidences, right? We know that there are no coincidences. Anyone else? Miss Ruth? Praying for uh, God's mercy for uh, Brad. Uh, I said pneumonia. Okay. A lot of other things. A lot of other things. Okay. I have a phrase. We have uh, we have people like uh, Miss Ruth and her daughter that are donated campers for use for this uh, for us to, and RVs for us to be able to use for the next uh, couple of weeks. And just real thankful for that. <coughs> thankful for all the workers that are here already. Brother Roger has a, a praise just for everyone uh, in the church and uh, just everyone in general who has, uh, has contributed, uh, supported the Builders for Christ and uh, campers uh, as well as food and, and anything else that has been given uh, to meet their needs. That is definitely the, the church in action. Brother Larry? One unspoken, Brother Larry. Barbara, did he beat you to that one? Okay. I just want to praise for those that were saved during vacation Bible school. Amen. Amen. Um, the Lord had laid one of those kids on my heart a while back, and I've been praying. Miss Laura has a, a praise for the uh, for those saved 
uh, VBS, uh, especially uh, people that she prayed for to get saved. I don't know how much sweeter that could be to pray for a salvation and then to have it happen. Yeah. How many did we have all together? Was it seven? Seven, seven souls. Amen. Seven new names written in glory Amen. at the end of VBS. And uh, she also has a co-worker who has a daughter uh, battling depression and uh, tried to hurt herself. Just all the things that go with that uh, with depression. Miss Peyton? Two unspoken prayer requests from Miss Peyton. So I have a prayer request. Um, I had shared with y'all uh, a couple months back how I'd had a little feeling, a little numbness in the side of the face. And the uh, doctor thought it might have been a little bout of Bell's palsy, um, which would have been like a temporary deadening of that. Uh, gave me some medication that made it go away for about a week, and it came back, and it's just been getting worse and worse. Um, went to my doctor and, um, you know, trying to figure out what that was due to. Sent me to an ENT because I also wanted to have um, look into hearing aids because I'm half deaf in this ear and totally deaf in this ear. And, you know, it's hard at home and at work, always having to turn your head and, eh, what do you say? So I uh, wanted to look into that. And he thought it was interesting that I was partially deaf in this one and totally deaf in that one. Said, let's, uh, let's do an MRI. I think I told you all we'd got that far. Uh, they did an MRI um, about two weeks ago. And that three centimeter tumor is pushing up against my brain stem. Uh, so met with the neurosurgeon yesterday and in two months I'm gonna be having brain surgery. So prayer request, Absolutely. pretty please. Uh, said if it was up in a certain area, they just pop the top off in an hour, hour and a half, they'd be done with it. But uh, it's in the back, pushing up against nerves, and so it's going to be a six-hour, taking little pieces out at a time process. So I'll be out in the hospital for a week or so, if all goes well. So please be in prayer. Yes, ma'am. Pray for Kathy. Okay. Prayer request for Miss Kathy. Um, her sister, Kathy Greer. Mm-hmm. Um, prayer request for Miss Kathy, uh, her sister Patsy Weir, and mom Lorraine Cochran, still dealing with uh, with health problems. Okay. Miss Linda. Okay. James, uh, senior. Okay. Uh, prayer request for uh, Brother James, uh, spine problems. Right on cue. <laughs> Mom? Um, I have a friend, Charlie Sprout. She has COVID and uh, has health issues already. And then her daughter, Bethany, has COVID as well. And then also, just I know we've been asking prayer for she wants to get well. Just pray that. Workers here. Did hey, you say your uh, your friend that was uh, was that Charmin? Okay, and and her daughter. They both have COVID. Okay. So, uh, mom's friend Charmin, her daughter Bethany have COVID. Um, also, a prayer request for uh, for camp that uh, Satan would be uh, kept at bay, yep. hearts would be changed, that the counselors would be uh, prepared, have their hearts in the right place, and that uh, prayers for the Builders for Christ workers. Uh, we got 100, de 100 degree days coming up, so uh, prayers for them. 
Miss Renee. I Mom. We can apply those to, word, to our decisions. Absolutely. Mom, uh, praise the Lord for his word, for, uh, for giving direction, and making hard decisions, specifically. Have you had that? Ms. Laura, uh, praying for uh, some health issues, uh, just trying to get off of some medicine, swap over to others, and that's is tricky, swapping medicine sometimes. Uh, just prayers for being able to get in to seeing a doctor, see a doctor soon to uh, address that. And uh, prayers for uh, Miss Amanda having to have some tests. Yes, sir, Brother Patrick. Uh, Brother Patrick, uh, prayers for his dad, Brother David, uh, not feeling well and uh, maybe having some uh, cognitive issues they need to look into. Yes. Five unspokens for Miss Shirley. Yes, Miss. Uh, um, Sam Henry went to the eye doctor um, a couple of days ago, and they said that um, he was off his eye drops, and so now he takes shots and folic acid and that's it. Uh, so Sam Henry, uh, eye doctor, is taking him off of drops and put him on shots. No, no, no. He just takes folic acid and shots. That's it. Folic acid and shots. Oh, okay. He was doing everything. And now we're, we're off the drops and only on folic acid. Okay, good. So one, one less medication for Sam Henry. Amen. That's praise the Lord. One less medication. Anyone else? Miss um, Lizzie? Mom, I guess it hurt a ball. Her name was Colette. About a month ago, she was diagnosed with breast cancer. And today she had to have surgery um, to keep her at home for the next three weeks. She didn't get as soon as the last week. Who has breast cancer? Uh, one of my mom's bosses. Oh, one of your mom's bosses. Okay. Okay. One of um, Miss uh, Jana's uh, managers has breast cancer. Anyone else? Prayer request, praise Miss Miss Peggy. Uh, Miss Peggy, uh, praise the Lord for uh, getting to go get her um, nieces. Too. Yeah, grandbabies, grandbabies. Yeah, <laughs> everyone related. If it's if it's not her grandbaby, it's her niece. And yeah, uh, praise the Lord.
Oh, we're getting uh, two uh, grand. My word. First for Miss Peggy. <laughs> uh, and also travel mercies uh, for uh, taking them back. Pray for our president. Pray for our president. To pray for us. Um, they're not really, uh, if we share their beliefs, they are in the position and because. to obey them, to be an example of Christ. I have a praise. Um, I thought about preaching on this one time, but it's been on my heart. I see so much and I read our song hundred years old sings tunes anymore. My soul didn't feel the least bit stirred over this antiquated music. Then when you just start getting out of the routine of looking up at the screen and there's within my heart and just reading words off a screen yeah. and you just think about the words. Yeah. And to take it a step further, I highly encourage Y'all just pick a hymn and just Google it, go to the library and look up the story behind it. Uh, song is um, uh, a guy with his wife. It's everything. Rescue him others. He lost, if not more. And in the grief, to write this song, and you can put in the skip the third verse. Sometimes there is. Oh, sometimes he leads deep. My. Way. Oh, the sometimes rough, and, and then he throws in another verse. There's within my heart a melody. This is someone who had lost his wife and/or children months before, but because of the love of God in his heart, he can come up with words like that. And this book is just full of soul stirring. Songs. So that's my praise to the Lord. Mom's always praising God for his word. I'm praising those people who were moved by the word and wrote about the word and just put a little tune to it. That's my praise to the Lord. That's it. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for just being able to come to you, Lord, for support or guidance in hard decisions, Lord, or encouragement when we're scared, or strength when we're weak. And Lord, just to, to come to you to bring our petitions to you, Lord, when, when others are scared or weak or helpless. Lord, we're so thankful to know that your word assures us that you hear our prayers all we have to do is bring them to you, Lord, and that burden is lifted off of us, that you have taken that burden. Lord, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for your promise that one day, Lord, all these burdens and all these sorrows and worries and fears will be wiped away in the twinkling of an eye. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Joe. I'll be praying for his um, surgery coming up uh, soon, and I'll be lifting that up every day, if you will. We've got a lot of that, and 
or we've dealt with that before around here, but we're going we're gonna to get through it just like we get through everything else. I wanted to say uh, a few things tonight before I get started in the message. You can turn your Bibles to Deuteronomy 21. That's where we're at in our Deuteronomy study. Uh, but my mom and dad are here. Some of you have noticed that. Um, he doesn't look a bit like me, but, um, you know. Anyway, uh, they're here, right here in the front. My nieces, they are my nieces, my great nieces, and they are her grandbabies. They're here, and it's good to see them. I've got uh, another family of mine, Brother Gary and Miss Marilyn, have been here several times already. They, they actually, you'll notice out on the sign it says, Welcome back, Builders for Christ and Campers on Mission. The reason why I put and Campers on Mission this year is because of these two. They, uh, these two families right here both work with Campers on Mission in Missouri, and they've put as much work uh, into this uh, building project with all the dirt work and everything that you see out there. And I am just, uh, I tell you what, uh, Brother Gary and Miss Marilyn, just bless my soul. Uh, every time we get to spend time with us, sometime, we even got to spend a little bit of time up in Branson with the seniors with them last year. Had a great time enjoying that fellowship with them. So glad they came back. So glad he brought Miss Marilyn with him. It's just no, not much fun without her here. And, uh, of course, uh, Brother Willie and Miss Dina uh, with Builders for Christ, uh, he, he came in early. He was planning on actually going to uh, be somewhere tonight and, 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 and so, but, but uh, they just decided to just hang out with us for the night, and so we're glad that they're here. Uh, Miss Dina whacked him across the head pretty good, and so uh, pray for that recovery as well. Actually, he actually fell out of bed and he hit the nightstand, and that's what did that. And so uh, I said, well, that's what that's Miss Dina's story. And so she, you don't know that she may have shoved you out of that. So, I'm just kidding. Sweet people, sweet group of people that come to help us. And we had another group from, uh, uh, from Cushana, Southern Baptist Group, uh, 8th District of Southern Baptist here in Louisiana. You see this big shower trailer out here? That's so all of those people who are coming next week who are staying in the church, at least, can have a place to shower and get cleaned up every day. and So uh, we're just really grateful for a lot of people who contributed. So thank you. If you're bringing desserts this next week or next week, thank you. If you've had any part in our building process, I thank you myself. So uh, it's been a couple of weeks since we were in our Deuteronomy study. Uh, last week, of course, we didn't have, have them because of our VBS. Uh, but uh, two weeks ago, we had just uh, begun here in, in Deuteronomy 21 where Moses is continuing this section of his sermon. Uh, pertaining to the distinguishable lives uh, of believers. And he's doing that by, by talking about some of the laws of God. And by the way, Miss Debbie, I don't know if that'll be on the screen or not. Did I put that? I did. I was like, I couldn't remember if I put that on or not. I had two great nieces running around. I was more interested in seeing them. So I'm glad I got it on the screen. But, but he's been talking about some of the laws of God and, how the, and the distinguishableness of Christians' lives. In chapter 21 here, he begins this chapter by discussing some of the laws of atonement uh, for an unsolved murder. Uh, keep in mind that one of the things which defiles the land is the shedding of innocent blood. Now, there's a lot of things that defile the land, but shedding of innocent blood is right there near the top of that. And that blood cries out from the ground, as we know was in the case with Cain and Abel. His blood cried out to God from the ground. And so God has some laws to atone for that blood and the cleansing of the land. First, uh, as we talked about last time, the closest city was determined, and that city would supply both the sacrificial heifer and the land on which that heifer was to be slain. And of course, this wasn't your typical sacrifice, for it was not done in the temple, and it was not done by the Levites. It was actually done by the elders of that closest city. But this, sac this sacrifice, you'll remember, uh, signified the innocent being slain for the guilty, which we also know points to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Atonement speaks of restoration uh, to divine favor or reconciliation to God. And so that's what that's talking about. Well, let's begin. Actually, let's read the first four verses again, which we talked about. And then we'll, we'll pick it up in verse 5 here tonight. If one be found slain in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee to possess it, lying in the field, and it be not known who has slain him. Then thy elders and thy judges shall come forth, and they shall measure unto the cities which are round about him that is slain. And it shall be that the city which is next unto the slain man, even the elders of that city, shall take an heifer, which hath not been wrought with, and which hath not drawn the yoke. And the elders of that city shall bring down the heifer under a rough valley. Uh, that was uh, a valley which is neither eared nor sown. And shall strike off the heifer's neck there in the valley, 
All right, and that's where we kind of left off talking. Verse 5 says, And the priests, the sons of Levi, shall come near. For them the Lord thy God hath chosen to minister unto him and to bless in the name of the Lord. And by their word shall every controversy and every stroke be tried. Now, the next step in the atonement process here for unsolved murders was that the priest's blessings were to be pronounced. And, and that was done by the Levitical priests who were God's chosen ministers and servants uh, in that capacity. They were also the judges, uh, you'll remember, in charge of handling controversies, in charge of handling crimes of that nature. Uh, by the way, do you remember uh, 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 who Jesus sent the lepers uh, to after he had healed them? He sent them to the priest, right? They were to present themselves before the priest so that the priest could pronounce them blessed or pronounce them clean. And that's what we see in that story. And that was part of the ministry of the Levitical priest in this capacity here. It was their duty to pronounce the land clean or blessed and no longer defiled by the blood. Atonement had been made for the murderous sin and the land was now no longer defiled. And it's the same with, with Christ Jesus' atonement for our sin today, only now it is God who pronounces that blessing. Once atonement was made and we accepted that atonement for our sin, we were also cleansed of all of our sin, or as the Bible speaks about, we were justified. Uh, the Greek word for justified simply means to render, to show, to declare, or to regard as innocent, righteous, or holy. And God justifies all those who accept Jesus' atonement uh, for their sin upon the cross. Romans 3, 24, verses 24 through 26. Now, Romans 3, 23, you remember, says, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And here's what it says next. Very important verses. Being justified, declared holy and righteous, freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God had set forth to be a propitiation. Christ Jesus was that atoning victim. That's what appropriate, uh, uh, propitiation means. Through faith in his blood. That is so important. Yeah. A lot of people today leave the blood out of their salvation messages. But folks, without the blood, there is no atonement for our sin. Yeah. I, I, we're, we're, we're lost as a goose if we don't accept Jesus' blood, because it's what cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And it says, uh, it goes on to say, through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission or the removal of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. That's what you're justified by. You're justified by the atoning blood of Jesus Christ. Isn't that awesome? How I mean, Miss Deidre was praising the Lord about part of this a while ago, but how the New Testament grace still lines up with Old Testament law. Yeah. I think that's uh, amazing when you really line it up. Now then, another part of this distinguishable law of God, and the reason why the closest city was called, is found in verse 6. It says, And all the elders of that city that are next unto the slain man shall wash their hands over the heifer that is beheaded in the valley. And they shall answer and say, Our hands have not shed this blood, neither have our eyes seen it. Be merciful, O Lord, unto thy people Israel, whom thou hast redeemed, and lay not innocent blood unto thy people of Israel's charge. And the blood shall be forgiven them, so shalt thou put away the guilt of innocent blood from among you, when thou shalt do that which is right in the sight of the Lord. By the way, that's what righteousness is all about doing that which is right in the sight of God. But here we see the city's innocence being proclaimed. And that was done in three ways. First, it was, it was signified by the washing of their hands over this beheaded heifer. Okay? The washing of hands signified was a picture of innocence. They were claiming their hands and themselves, by the way, to be clean of any wrongdoing in this matter. In Psalm 26, 6, David said, I will wash mine hands in innocency, so will I can pass thine altar, O Lord. And of course, you and I know that the washing of hands, uh, should, uh, it, I mean, it, it at least should sound somewhat familiar to you if you've been a Christian for any amount of time. 
you remember that Pilate, whenever Jesus was brought before him, and he was trying to free him. Pilate went to the basin, and he washed his hands. And he says, I am innocent. I am free of this just man. I am innocent of this just man's blood. Right? And the people cried, His blood be upon us and our children. They had no idea what they were saying, did they? That's one of the saddest statements in all of the Bible. I mean, sometimes it's just best to keep your mouth shut. And that was one of them. Little did they realize what they were saying. And though Pilate had the power to release Jesus, he still allowed him to be crucified, so his, his hands weren't all that clean either. Secondly, the city's innocence was proclaimed when while they were washing their hands, they also proclaimed the innocence by their mouth. They did so by action. Washing their hands over the heifer was an action that showed their innocence. And they also declared it by mouth. By saying, we are, we are innocent. Our hands have not shed this blood. Neither have our eyes seen it. They not only stated their innocence, but they were also stating that they had not witnessed or heard anything at all, which was declaring that they had no knowledge concerning the matter of this man's murder whatsoever, or this woman's murder whatsoever. Now, this was very important, because if they were not truthful in these statements, then the judgment of God might be upon those particular individuals with the knowledge uh, of that matter, or it might even be upon the entire city. Do you remember when... Uh, uh, and actually, this event that I'm about to explain to you happens after they go into the promised land. They're, they're on the verge of getting ready to go in at this point. But when they go in and they overtake Jericho, they were told not to take anything. And you remember what Achan did, right? Achan took of the Babylonian garment and, 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 uh, and of the cursed thing and some of the gold and the silver that was supposed to be put in the treasury. And he hit, went and hid it. Well, in their next battle in Ai, there's a little old bitty town, 35 or 36 people were killed. They didn't lose one person in Jericho. Now this little old bitty town, they lose several people and they're trying to figure out what's going on. Well, because Achan, one person, one person had taken of the curse that there was sin in the camp and because of that, God cursed all of the army of Israel. So that can happen if we're not completely honest and open with these things that God's calling. Many will claim innocence, but that doesn't make them innocent. But there was a third very important part here. I told you they claimed innocence in three ways. It's involved in the city's innocence being proclaimed, and that made it very dangerous for any city to withhold information regarding these unsolved mysteries. Verse 8 says that the city also prayed for God not to lay innocent blood to their charge. Now, of course, this is what Jesus prayed on the cross. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. It's the same thing Stephen prayed as he was being stoned to death for his faith. But in this prayer, if they were asking for innocent blood not to be laid upon their charge, when they knew something about the murder that they were not sharing, then they were also getting God involved in their deception. And that's a very dangerous road to be on. They would be using God to appear innocent. People do that all the time, don't they? they? They act real spiritual. They act like they're real godly, but they're really using God in their deception. That's a very dangerous road to be on because God takes these things very seriously. He don't want to be associated with liars, right? But when the elders of that city had, all, had done all of this stuff, verse 8 says that the innocent blood of the murdered person was then forgiven. Verse 9 says that this was how atonement was made for an unsolved murder. God says this was right in his sight and how the land was to be purified or cleansed of its defilement. And though some of these laws might seem a little odd to us, remember they, they set apart God's people as being distinguishably different from the rest of the world. You see, there were a lot of things involved in the cleansing of the land here, of this innocent blood, but it just shows us how much God cares about every single human being on this planet and how precious life really is. Not only to him, but also to his people. 
Yes, God allowed capital punishment. We talked about that a couple of chapters ago when it was called for. But that's only because he cares a great deal about every other single life on this planet. But if you thought that law was odd, or rather odd, let's read in verse 10. Let's move on here tonight. We've got a few minutes. We won't get all the way through this one tonight, but it's okay. He begins to address another law, another distinguishable law for God's people. He says, Well, now goest forth to war against thine enemies. And the Lord thy God hath delivered them into thine hands. And thou hast taken them captive. And seest among the captives a beautiful woman. And hast a desire unto her that thou wouldest have her to thy wife. Then thou shalt bring her home to thine house. She shall shave her head and pare her nails. She shall put the raiment of her captivity from off her and shall remain in the house and bewail her father and her mother a full month. And after that thou shalt go in unto her and be her husband and she shall be thy wife. And it shall be if thou have no delight in her then thou shalt not let her go or thou shalt let her go whither she will but thou shalt not sell her at all for money. Thou shalt not make merchandise of her because thou hast humbled her. Kind of an odd law here for Moses to be preaching on and speaking of here. One of those very unique laws of God that doesn't even sound like a law of God, does it? Doesn't sound like it lines up with the rest of Scripture, but hopefully this will make a little clearer sense to you once we're done. Keep in mind, however, this is one of the laws that, that God would distinguish his people from other nations who generally just took women and children as either slaves or whatever, right? As a matter of fact, many times the women were ravaged and then killed not long after that. And if they weren't, they and their children were enslaved by the invading army while the men were generally killed in battle. Well, let's look closer at some of these laws for for potential wives of, of women of, of the captivity when they, would, when they would take captives. Now remember, according to the law of Moses given by God, Jews were only supposed to marry who? Other Jews, but not just other Jews. Jews within their own tribe. They weren't even supposed to marry outside of the tribe. Like if you were of the, of the tribe of, of Reuben, you weren't supposed to marry somebody out of the tribe of Joseph or, or out of the tribe of... Levi or whatever. I mean, that's just the way God had it set up in his law. Now, there were exceptions in Scripture, uh, but they were rare. One that comes to mind was, you remember after the Benjamite men uh, were slain by Israel for a very grievous sin against all of Israel in the book of Judges, there were 400 women of Jabesh Gilead who were brought to the tribe of Benjamin in order to preserve the tribe of Benjamin's seed. Okay. We also know from Scripture that proselytes or, or Jewish converts were allowed to marry, even though they were born Gentile, if they were converted to Judaism, they were allowed to marry uh, within the tribes of Israel. As far as this scenario goes with war and captive women, we know that the first battle that's going to take place, which I just mentioned about Jericho a while ago, that there's a certain harlot who's there who's going to be saved, her and her family. Remember what her name was? Rahab the harlot. That's right. Good job, honey. You wrote it. You should know all the answers. I'm just kidding. Rahab the harlot was there, right? Now then, think about this for a second. Do you know who she actually ended up marrying? She married a guy by the name of Salmon. That's right. You know they had a son? You know what his name was? What's your dog's name? I just knew you was going to get that one right. They had a son named Boaz. Boaz married Ruth. They had a son named Obed. Obed had a son named Jesse. Jesse had a son named David. This is a Gentile woman, a proselyte that came in, right? Because she had taken care of the spies. Also keep in mind in regards to this law that there were laws in the law of Moses which were placed there as Jesus said, because of the hardness of their hearts. Right? Jesus pointed out in the law of Moses that Moses allowed for certain bills of divorcement because of what? The hardness of their hearts. It was not so in the beginning. Why? Because God, his intent was never divorce. 
His intent was, was for them to remain together until death separated them. That's what it was. But, but Jesus said, in the law of Moses, Moses allowed you because of the hardness of your heart. So some of these laws that are written in here were because of the hardness of their hearts, right? Matter of fact, Matthew Henry points this out about this particular passage. He says, for the hardness of their hearts, Moses gave them this permission, lest if they had not had liberty given them to marry such, they should have taken liberty to defile themselves with these women. And by such wickedness, the camp would have been troubled. And that makes sense. Certainly a possibility here. But in the case of women being taken captive in war, if a soldier had taken a woman captive and desired to have her for his wife, then there was a set of laws that God gives here through Moses for that process to begin. Okay? It wasn't like the way the world done it. I'll talk about that here in just a minute. This is what made God's laws so distinguishable from man's. Man's laws just allowed him to do whatever he wanted with her. That's the world's way. All right? But it's not God's. As a matter of fact, this entire passage first teaches no sexual relations until marriage. Right? That in itself is already quite distinguishable from the world. Our world today teaches the exact opposite. No marriage until sexual relations have already been well established. That's not God's word. Nowhere is it. This law clearly goes along with the teaching of scriptures. It gave the Holy Spirit an opportunity to be in control of him instead of his flesh. Many times a young man or woman just wants to gratify their flesh by, by acting upon it and then always regretting it. That happens with, with anything having to do with fleshly desires, not just those physical relations. It happens when our anger wants to control us. It happens when we think we want something really bad. We go out and we buy it instantaneously, right? And then later, at the end of the month, when we get that first bill, we're like, man, what did I buy that for? I know I'm not the only one guilty of that in here in this room, right? That's flesh controlling us. And that's what this is talking about as well. So this is a pretty wise law of God's and giving these men a, a cooling off period, if you will. Just some time to carefully consider what they're contemplating. And listen, when you're talking about captive women, there may be several things she needs time for. Having lost any of her family uh, uh, she had had, had had prior to this event, she would not only be in mourning, which, which this passage of Scripture allows for, but she might also have quite the disdain or hatred for the Israelites. They just came and destroyed everything she and her family and all her relatives had. This would give her some time to collect her thoughts and realize her new surroundings. And let me tell you something, a cool enough time is always wise. It keeps us from making unwise decisions, right? I mean, how many decisions do we make on the spot all the time without considering, without thinking about them? without thinking about everything that goes along with it, but especially, especially when choosing to make a lifelong commitment to someone. Outward beauty is only skin deep. That's what these guys saw. But it's a godly idea and law to take some time to figure out who they are on the inside before you marry them, especially young people listen to that. As a matter of fact, that's, that's probably the first thing you should consider about a person, not what's on the outside. God's law and God's word when it comes to taking anyone for a mate includes no relations before marriage. The sexual act when done within the confines of a godly marriage can display a true token of their inner love for one another. It also tells the person they're marrying how important they believed it was to, they, to save themselves only for them. But outside of marriage, it's just lust. That's it. It ain't love. People like to think it is. Matter of fact, it's very deceiving to some people. They get very confused. They think, oh, he loves me. Or she's in love with me. No, if, if that's all you're doing outside of confines of marriage, it's just lust. That's all it is. Lust is a false reality of true love. It's not real. 
And listen, I could spend weeks just discussing this point from God's word. But the next step in possibly taking a captive as a wife was that these women were to be taken to the captor's home. And of course, with this included the responsibility of providing all of their essential needs like room, board, clothing, food, all that stuff and, and, and other basic necessities. And in keeping within the context of this passage, she was to be treated kindly and in a very appropriate manner. And since we're talking at least one month here, this could be quite costly as well. Another mouth to feed, another provision to make. And one of the things they were to do, which again might seem rather odd, was to have their heads shaved, their nails pared, or the Hebrew word means clipped, and given a change of clothing as opposed to the clothes they had been wearing. Some commentators believe that pairing here means to let her nails grow out, uh, but either way, whatever it means, along with being given the attire of a Jewish woman, here's what these particular laws that he just spoke about were intended to do. They were intended to make her less attractive because that was what he was attracted to. The Bible says that a long hair, that a woman's long hair is her glory. And of course, when it comes to appearances, the very next thing in line is her clothing and her nails. Right? They're quite important to them. As a matter of fact, I was reading one commentary which talked about how some women, when an invading army was approaching, especially if they were pretty sure they were going to lose, would array themselves in their best apparel so as to be attracted to their captors. But doing these things, it's believed, might help curtail the fleshly desires for her. But there was another important reason, and, 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 and commentators agree. And again, I know I quote him a lot, but Matthew Henry makes a lot of sense here. He says, these things were done in token of her renouncing idolatry, the shaving of the head, the pairing of the nails, changing of the raiment, in token of her renouncing idolatry and becoming a proselyte to the Jewish religion. See, if they were from another nation, they worshiped another god. The shaving of her head, the pairing of her nails, and the changing of her garment signified her putting off her former conversation that she might become a new creature like we do in Christ Jesus. She must remain in this house to be taught the good knowledge of the Lord and the worship of Him in those 30 days. And the Jews say that if she refused and continued obstinate in idolatry, He must not marry her. And that makes a great point. This gives him 30 days to witness to her, basically, in a sense. And of course, all of that would make perfect scriptural sense because we know that the Bible tells us not to be unequally yoked together with an unbeliever. Don't marry an unbeliever, young people. Whatever you do. I, I even believe that, it's, that you ought to marry within your faith. They believe what you believe. If you're going to be strong to your faith, then I think you ought to, if you're a Baptist, you ought to marry a Baptist. I mean, you're going to have a hard time if you, married, if you marry a devoted Catholic, and, and I don't have anything against Catholics, but, but they have different beliefs. You're going, to have, you're going to have problems. Paula, bless her heart, she was raised Pentecostal. Now she finally got right with the Lord, and, and uh, I'm just kidding. It's a joke, Mom. I was just kidding, okay? But, but, I mean, we had, Paula and I had several debates about that. But it's very important that you marry a child of God who loves you or who loves God more than they love you. But after they both had 30 days to consider these things, if he so chooses, he could take her as his wife. The law stated uh, to either marry them or let them go. And that would certainly be more merciful to them than how the rest of the world treated captive women. But if he chooses not to take her to be his wife, then verse 14 says, he must let her go wherever she wants to go. He could not sell her as a slave or anything else. This would also be merciful and kind. Much different than the way the world treated him. Now don't misunderstand here. This is not saying that he could have her as his wife first and then decide to let her go. That's not what verse 14 is saying. The phrase in verse 14, for thou hast humbled her, doesn't mean that he has defiled her by having those physical relations with her and then kicks her out. That's not what that's saying at all. The word humbled there means that he afflicted, he's afflicted or troubled her life. 
Some think he greatly disappointed her after getting her hopes up of marriage. It could also speak of the affliction she now has of being both homeless and now, since he's decided not to marry, to also be husbandless. She could go back home if there was a home to go home to. Actually, in some cases, not taking her as her wife could have been even more devastating to her. But God's law calls for us living distinguishably different lives than the rest of the world. And that certainly applies here. You would agree with me that the rest of the world would have a different set of rules for this than what God has here. And that was for the woman and it was also for the man. All right, so... God wants us to live distinguishably different lives. That's why God says don't marry somebody that's not a believer. God has his reasons. He wants you to live a distinguishably different life than the rest of the world because let me tell you something. There's no happiness in living that way. The world's way won't work. I've tried it. Ask my mom. She'll tell you she prayed very hard for me for many years. I'd get my life right with God. She prayed too hard because then I became a preacher. But hey, it, it all worked, okay? Let me tell you something. The world's way of living don't work. God's way does. He has his laws for particular reasons. It's because he loves us, he wants us to do right, and he wants us to have that, that blessed, that, that happy, not that cursed life by disobedience, but that blessed life 